Welcome to this week's Fireside Chat with Jesse. I am joined today by Jacqueline Manning, Vice President of Marketing at Amur. Amur. Uh, like, <laughs> How do you say it? Slaughter. <laughs> so I, I, I mean, you just told me beforehand because I tried to, I practice the intros because like I tell people that's what I mess up the most. And uh, yeah, so we're just going to go into uh, Amur. <laughs> But let's dive into that. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Jesse. So it's funny when you ask me, you know, what's your title? How do I say this again? Um, it is pronounced more like love with no E. So more, but it's amazing at all the conferences, even at NIFA, we're on the bus. I'm walking down the aisle of the bus and everyone's like, hey, Amur's on the bus. And I'm like, no, 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 more. And so we started practicing with everyone there. It's a more. I mean, can you put like a little like, thing on top of the U. <laughs> you you probably could, although it's amazing how many people really butcher it and how many variations there are. It's it's amazing. I think it's really and, from, and, from a, and from a marketing perspective, the person who runs marketing, I can only imagine where you're just like, oh come on. Yeah. Yeah. Even when we hire new salespeople and I train them and they come on board and I'm like, okay, step one, let's talk about the name of the company. It's pronounced a more right so uh i try to make it a point to make sure everyone says it properly and correctly so okay that's a good place to start good place to All start right. a more a more got it i will do my best not to slaughter that uh, so i apologize if i do that's in the okay. future um jacqueline for those people who might not be familiar with yourself you mind just kind of you know introducing you and your career to date in equipment finance sure yeah so I'm Jacqueline Manning, Vice President of Marketing at Amore Equipment Finance. I have worked with Amore for a little over six years now. Been in this industry-ish for about nine, almost 10 years, almost a decade. So hopefully most people know me. If not, um, I would say come and introduce yourself when you see me at a show or if I'm speaking. <laughs> I love to meet people, especially since I'm a board member for, for NEFA. Um, but Amor Come in Finance, it's been a, a great, amazing, insane, crazy journey over the past six years. I'll just give a, a little bit of background for Amor for people that don't know who we are and what we do. Yeah. Uh, we are the largest and fastest growing independent equipment finance provider in the U.S. catering to small businesses. We are located out of Grand Island, Nebraska. So Jesse, have you ever been to Grand Island, Nebraska? You, you know what? When it was the... Before it was a more, I forgot the name of the company. I was over there at that time. Okay, um, you have been. So, so I, I've been there once. I drove from Omaha there, and I'm like, "Where am I going? Like, yeah. <laughs> like am I in? Am I in Colorado?" <laughs> right. Yeah. So you've been. So most people I talk to have not been to Grand Island, but yeah. um, but it is grand, and the people are are even more grand. So yes, yeah, so that's our headquarters in Grand Island, Nebraska. We've been around for over 25 years. We have about 300 employees nationwide with nine uh, regional offices. So uh, record-breaking year. I don't know if you saw the news on us recently, but- I did, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. So a lot of hard work and dedication from the team. And um, it's very exciting to, to have this momentum behind us. So we're uh, coming off of a really good, strong Q1. The you know market's doing, doing great. Um, a lot of momentum at Amore and looks like we're on pace to do hopefully one and a half billion this year, potentially even um, crush our goals. So very exciting times. So that's us. We, um, I know we talked a little bit about, you know, what does Amore do and, and where do we cater? So I'll just give some more information in case people don't know, but we are a um, small ticket lender for those that don't know who we cater to, small ticket, 10,000 yep. to about 3 million. Um, we have the most inclusive platform in the industry, allowing us to serve all industries and all credit profiles. Um, and so that's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When you can have a, a financial product for anyone, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah, it's great. And we, we also, you know, look at startups. So that's exciting. Also, not, not everyone, uh, especially our size will look at startups, but we believe in small business. So now, now you're in the Northeast, right? I am. I'm located out of Boston. And so do you guys have any other brick and mortar locations other than Grand Island? We have, well, that's our corporate headquarters, but we have offices in New York, in New Hampshire, which is not okay. far from me, California, Iowa, South Dakota. So we have okay. offices all over. You guys are, you guys are all over the place. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. 
Um, one of the things I want to get into, Jacqueline, if you don't mind, is the top women in leasing designation and kind of what, what how'd that feel when you got that email from Rita? And then when you got the publication and you see your, you know, your face and your bio next to, you know, the other women in equipment finance, how'd that make you feel? Let's, let's talk about that, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, I, I wish it was as simple as um, getting the email from Rita, but it didn't really go like that. There's a fun story behind it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was, I was at, I think it was a NEFA conference and there was all this chatter about the monitor coming out with um, their first edition to recognize top women in equipment finance. And someone had come over to the booth and had told me about this. And my first reaction was, what, who are they featuring? And how could they not feature somebody from Amor? Are you kidding me? So I like walked up to Lisa and Susie and I said, so, you know, word on the street is that you, you guys are gonna be featuring, you know, top women in, in equipment finance. And how can you have an article like that, an edition like that, which is amazing by the way, and not feature someone from Amor? And Lisa said, oh, we're featuring someone from Amor. And I said, you are? Can you tell me who? And she said, you. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, so that's how that went down. Um, I, did not, I did not expect it, um, but I was very happy to, I'm honest, you know, honestly, I was very honored and humbled to hear the news, but that's how, that's how that went down. And that's how I found that out. But all that aside, the chaos aside, you know, first of all, I would say when I found out that Monitor was doing it, I think it's wonderful that in an industry that is predominantly male driven to this day, right? We just came back from NEFA. You and I were both there. And I think there were almost 400 attendees and I think 87 women at the women's luncheon. So we still have some room for improvement in terms of female yep. representation in the industry, but, but fantastic growth. Um, yep. So I would say, you know, I was really excited to hear that the monitor was doing profile pieces on women leaders and trailblazers in the equipment finance space, and especially making sure that we've had multiple people from a more recognized now, um, yeah. you know, and we, we are a predominantly women uh, run organization and huh? more than 50% of our staff and leadership staff is uh, is made up of women. So that's really exciting, especially in, in finance, equipment finance. But I think overall, it it's amazing. And we have to work harder to put more women in leadership roles and recognize um, the influence that women are having in this space. So hats off to Lisa and the whole monitor team for, for really taking that initiative and recognizing women in this space. I think it's fantastic. No, I, I mean, absolutely. And that's kind of been one of the focuses on EFC, you know, it's just, it's causing it creating that awareness because people just don't understand when you have a more diverse C-suite, when you have that diversity, it drives like profitability because absolutely. it's just not like you're not in a cylinder anymore with everyone that thinks alike. It's different ideas. <laughs> absolutely. And there's data that can back that up, right? So it's just about yeah. making sure we can create a more diverse and inclusive industry. I like how you did that, a more. Is that intentional? Was that, was that intentional? Oh, okay, okay, that's fantastic, that's fantastic. And also, um, I mean, congrats on that panel. I apologize for not being able to be in there, but I mean- We're conflicting. Of, of those, what was there, of the five people on the panel, what, four females to one yeah. male? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, progress, right? <laughs> it's progress. No, it's great. I mean, the panel itself was about leadership in the space. And we talked about how just the representation on the panel has changed over time, right? And you were conflicting, you were in the room next to us, and you were talking about, you know, women, right? <laughs> and women leaders and, and a very important topic. And I wish I would have been able to go and listen to that, because I think that's all really relevant and important as well. Yeah. Nope, nope, and, and thank you again for, for that, Jacqueline. Um, it was a fun conversation. The only feedback that I had was people wished that we weren't conflicting with one yeah. of the things, but we'll work on that next time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, next thing I wanna kind of get into is like, like marketing strategy. Um, your marketing pieces that you have are phenomenal. Um, and just like the way that when people look at your organization and what you guys have, you know, done over the last few years. Do you mind just kind of getting into 
like your strategy around how you're marketing it more? Sure. I would say that over, you know, the, the six years that I've been here, it's really evolved. Right. And so I, you know, the beginning, when I first started first few years were really spent on building the brand and the mission and the vision and our core values. And we're really focused on culture. And, you know, we've had some recognition in the, in the industry for having, you know, one of the best cultures in the equipment finance space. And that's something that we're really dedicated to and really motivated by. And so really spending time from a marketing perspective, trying to understand what is the heart and soul of our organization. And it is our people and it is the attitude and the compassion. And, and then we have this leopard, right? And a more leopard as sort of the emblem and, and the face of the brand and trying to tie those two together and saying, how do our people represent the traits of an Amore Leopard and how does an Amore Leopard represent the traits of our people? And so that- Does a, does a leopard have a name? It does, it does. Our leopard name, le leopard's name is Axel, Axel. So that is our leopard's name. So if you come to our website and you're chatting, we, you know, we have some fun with it. Um, Axel, you know, is a, is a mascot. We have a full Amor leopard costume. We had somebody who, um, you know, goes out and goes to local events in Grand Island and will dress up as an Amor leopard and throw out candy to kids <laughs> at parades and stuff. So we have a lot of fun with it because it's part, fun is part of our culture also. So yeah really trying to hone in on our culture and our people and differentiating ourselves in terms of who we are, what we do and how we're different and around service, right? The service that we provide. So a lot of foundational work was done in the beginning from a marketing perspective. And I think what people see now is a lot of that initial work and then pulling that out, right? So we say, an Amore Leopard is a cat. We're curious, agile, and, and tenacious. So a cat, right? That's what we hire for. That's our culture. Um, we have core values, so forth and so on. And then just bold colors, the green eyes of an Amore Leopard, which are unique to that. That's a lot of what you see from our brand perspective. And then messaging, customization, you know, and our go-to-market strategy is really about how we leverage what separates us. And it's our people and our service and our culture. Yeah. And making sure that every single touch point, whether it's myself with one of my peers or someone and a partner or with our customers directly, the small business owners that we serve, it's making sure that we provide that, you know, amazing level of service that if you ever dealt with anyone from Nebraska, you will know that they provide the best customer service, you know, probably in the nation, right? So it's really about running that through the entire organization. And that's really the foundation of what our marketing was built on historically. And then it's evolved, right? I mean, we right. just went through a pandemic. We're still sort of hopefully coming out of it, but the ability to be agile, which is part of who we are, right? From that cat and the ability for our organization to look at how do we change and how do we evolve and how do we show up and meet our customers and partners and our employees where they right. need to be met, when they need to be met. And, uh, and we did that. I think we did that very successfully throughout the pandemic. And um, we're very proud of, of how we were able to transition and show up for each other. Uh, and our CEO, Mustafiz, you know, he came on in the beginning of the pandemic and said, you know, we're not gonna lay anyone off and everyone's gonna have a job. Um, and he, he kept to his word. And, and I was a little nervous, right? I was like, okay, that's, that, that maybe is a little premature to make that. that but, um, yeah. he, he kept up to his, his commitment and we didn't lose anyone. And, and, uh, and they were troubling times, but we got through it. We were able to be agile and um, we became a, a PPP lender and we were able to provide PPP, you know, funding to hundreds and thousands of, you know, small businesses that really needed the funds. So that's been really exciting from a marketing perspective in Got terms it. of where I started, where we started as a business and where we've grown. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we're just getting started. We have, we have so much more we want to accomplish, which is exciting. Absolutely. Um, from a, with a culture like you have at, at, a, at a more, um, the pandemic's impact on that, like onboarding people um, when you can't be in person, like, how did that impact um, the organization? 
Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, we had less than nine offices when the pandemic started, and we opened a couple more offices during the pandemic, which was <laughs> wow. maybe bold, maybe bold. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. But we were, we, we, we hired additional staff, especially when we became a PPP lender, we had to be able to have additional staff so we could support the needs of these small businesses. And it was really interesting to be able to shift, right? So one of our proudest moments, I think, and we don't talk about it often, but one of our proudest moments is when the pandemic hit and everything shut down two mm -hmm. years ago, we were able to quickly turn to make everyone working remotely within 24 hours across the organization. Wow. And that that's a testament to our IT team and to them being able to be prepared, to have access, to provide support and training. And then additionally on the HR side, it's a testament to our HR team to get the connectivity between people, right? A lot of what we had historically was people in the office being able to have those you know, one-to-one -one conversations, the water yeah. cooler conversations, the intimate moments. How do you recreate that when we have right. a culture that is so important to who we are as an identity? So our HR team, you know, they did a great job. We had all different types of initiatives and, you know, different Zoom meetings and activities. And we had, you know, yoga and we did, you know, we had brought a magician in and we did, you know, uh, meditation and all kinds of different things to try to make sure that there was connectivity between our people. And that really got us through. And on top of that, we made sure that all of our leaders were asking the right questions and showing up for people because as you know, right, you're a parent, I'm a parent, challenging and juggling work, children, life, a pandemic. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. <laughs> yeah. And so how do you make sure you can support your people and have them feel connected. There were a lot of mental health issues, right? There still are. And we talk about it and we make sure we give them the resources and we make sure that they feel like they have room to breathe and feel supported. And if you have to show up for your children or for your parents or for someone that you have to take care of, giving them the space and opportunity to do so, it's really important. So no, you know, it's mean, great to watch. No, that's fantastic. And I, I've, I don't know if you know Nancy Robles, if you ever met her before at Eastern. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they are uh, in New York okay. and they are 50% um, of their organization is my, are minorities and they are thriving um, as an organization. And the way that they, she has different finance, uh, not financial, mental well being things that she does for her employees. Um, and she mentioned yoga and I'm like, if I do yoga, my camera is not going to be on. Okay. This is not <laughs> something okay. that does, right. that does it. <laughs> it's like, no, no I'm not. But so I've mentioned it to my team and they're like, well, only if Jesse's on camera and I'm like, come on. Um, right. And then, you know, of course they were like, when well, we want you to wear this and I'm like, great. Right. Right. But, but so you, if that's, if that's what makes them happy. <laughs> right. Did you do it? Um, 75% of it. Um, <laughs> I still, I still owe them the entire thing, but <laughs> outfit was completely ridiculous. It was like something out of the eighties, right. like some neon oh. pink socks with some they were not nice stuff. To you. Oh no, they were not nice at all. No. Like I went to the yeah. office in Indianapolis and they set up the, my office in like a namaste, like, I mean, good for them. I mean, they went right. all out to they make really it welcoming. Did. And I'm like, come on, people. But, you know, right. it's fun. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> great. I love that. I mean, I'm not sure. They should have maybe cut you a little bit of slack just because it was your first time. You know, maybe, you know, A for effort and just want you to participate. But they went all in. So good for them. Oh, they, they rose me. They raised me and I'll, I'll get it. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Good. Um, so on the uh, social media side, um, you know, let's face it, this industry is still not very progressive, um, really old school. I mean, you look at some of these websites and it's like, was this done when the internet came out? Right. right. <laughs> what, what are you finding um, from a social media strategy perspective, Jacqueline, on what's working for you? Yeah, you know, it's, it is interesting, right? I mean, to your point, Jesse, we have to be honest with ourselves, right? We work in financial services and 
that is a very challenging market, regardless of the niche that we're in equipment finance, but financial services in general yeah. is very challenging from a social media perspective, right? Because we're, we're service providers and we are really only included in people's lives at times when they need us most, right? It's not, yeah. we're not a part of their daily life. And, and these are some barriers that we have to, we have to work to get over, but social media is a part of our culture. Right. If you look at, especially during the pandemic, how much time people were spending on social media. Oh, yeah. If companies, regardless of industry, right, don't have a social media strategy, if they don't have someone working on social media, if they don't have a social media presence, they're not in the narrative, right? And they're being left behind. And so I would say in general, everyone has work to do, right? And I'm not yeah. gonna sit here and tell you that, you know. I go to bed at night and say, we're crushing it on social media. I'm not, right? I think to myself, there's so much opportunity to leverage social media, um, but it, it comes down to balancing, you know, what you really have resources to support and what you don't. And so for us, it's really just about consistency, right? Yeah. It's about being relevant, right? We wanna make sure that the content we're putting out there is really relevant. It's also a delicate balance of listening and talking. And so I think a lot of people get it wrong. I'll see a lot of people on LinkedIn and they just push out content and it's, they wanna tell their version of, of a story and they just pump out content, but they're not really getting engagement. They're not engaging and they're not necessarily interested in listening to yeah. what the whole purpose of the conversation is. Right. But to me, I would say in terms of social media strategy, it really comes down to having finding a delicate balance on, are you doing enough listening? What, what does your customers, your partners, your peers, your employees, your communities, what are they saying on social? How can you show up? How can you be relevant? How can you drive engagement? And I think collectively across the industry, we have a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear that. I mean, there's people who are like, oh, you need to post three or four times a day um, because we're, I was just working with my marketing team on that. I'm like, do not do that. Right. I'm right. like, no. I'm like, I think when I started, we had 150 followers on LinkedIn. I think we're almost 750 now. And I'm like, you will start to lose people and I will be one of them because right. that's just not something that, I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't believe in that. Like, um, you'll kind of see my strategy that I do for myself. Um, and that's different than an organization, but, um, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's relevant, relevant, like yeah, it's, quality over quantity. Absolutely. I was just gonna say that. It's not about, and, and I've worked with large digital agencies who say we want X and, you know, X number of content posts per day. And I'm like, how about we really focus on the quality of the content, right? And driving deep engagement around that particular post versus, you know, how many posts are we doing a day, a week, so forth and so on. So that's really, I think the framework that we need to really look to. And, and also it's a challenge. I mean, just as a board member, right? For NEFA, we talk about it all the time. You, we go to these conferences in the, in the industry and they're very social, conferences, right? It's built around networking. And a lot of the conversation is how can we take what happens at these events and how can we move them to social media so that instead of waiting every six to seven months to speak to people and talk about what's trending in the space, yeah. we can take the conversation to social. And we haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, I'm excited to see if and when we get there, but we're just not yeah. there yet. Yeah. Well, and that, it's also one of those things where you just sit there and, and I, I think we're so caught up in making sure it's perfect as right. opposed to, it's like, yeah, hey, let's give this a shot. Let's give this a shot. Because, right. you know, last thing you want to do is be chastised because, oh, I tried something different. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like little nuggets of information go a long way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so speaking of NIFA, um, you and May chaired the Charlotte event. Um, <laughs> and and I, I do feel bad. I, I I don't know, something about public speaking that you just overthink it. And then when I heard Jake Olson tell his thing, I was trying not to cry for like an hour. Um, I cried. I don't know about you, but so, I cried for 
oh, no. I was I was just sitting there. I'm like, oh my god, like because I was sitting in my head. I'm like, oh my god, I have to say something. Like, and then I'm sitting there listening to this guy's story. I'm like, dude, really? You got you have problems? <laughs> Kid was tw- twelve. Um, you know, I was gonna sit there. You know, after Amy kind of thanked our um, committee that we had and say that you and May put such a good conference together in Charlotte. And I, I apologize for not giving you the accolades that you deserve because that conference in Charlotte was, I've been in NEFA since 2005 when it was EAEL. Like the level or the quality, I guess, of that conference was not something that I've seen from the organization. So kudos to you and May for doing that. Um, and that was, I think, when we kicked off our committee where it's like, okay, how do we take that and how do we do our best to get to that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, you know, I, I appreciate that to be honest with you, Jesse, because it was, it was something that I think we were all very passionate about. I mean, we're coming off of the pandemic. NIFA historically has been a very uh, event driven, event focused association. And so we knew that our members were looking for an event that, you know, really, um, my dog is barking in the background. We're just going to keep going. Um, it's okay. He, so, wants to, he wants to be involved. I, I, it's fine. We're, we're inclusive on this show. Dogs have. We voice, are inclusive. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we knew that we wanted the, the event, the first event back from the pandemic to really leave an impression and, and to make sure that members felt like, okay, we stuck with NIFA for a reason. There's deep value here, really good connections. And we wanted it to be the best event, you know, that NEPA had put on. And, and that's no disrespect to any event that anyone chaired prior, but we really focused on elevating the experience. That's really what we were focused on. And I think that, you know, you and Amy did a fantastic job in California in carrying the baton to an elevated experience. That's really what we were trying to do. And because to be honest with you, that's, that's what our members want. You know, they want to go to an association event and they want a level of sophistication. And that was just really important to us. And I think, uh, I think May had a large hand in that. I think she crushed it. She did a great job. No, that's, that's fantastic. And then especially with like, you know, is there going to be masks? Cause they're not going to be masks. Right. You know, I, I walked into the, cause I don't mind. I mean, it's like with even the EFC events that we put on, you follow the local jurisdictions of where you're at because that's, you need to have a foster a safe environment, but still you, you just don't know what that's going to be like. Right. And yeah. then it's like, I walk in the bar the first night and I'm like, okay, I guess not. Yep. Well, we were, <laughs> I was overly concerned about it because we did those bracelets and it was I thought it was a great idea. It was like, you know, red, don't come within, you know, six feet of me, yellow, you know, I'm open for an elbow pump and green, I'm all in, give me a hug. And no one took a bracelet, you know, I'm there for about a minute and everyone had their masks off and everyone was hugging and, you know, it's like long lost friends. So I said, okay, <laughs> we're back. <laughs> so, we're, we're, so we're here. <laughs> we're right. so we're at. Yeah. Um, and then is sticking on NIFA, if you don't mind, how long have you been on like the board and like, what does that like mean to you, that position? Well, this will be, um, coming up on my third year, um, as a board member. And, you know, it's interesting when they had approached me. So I, I was approached by, uh, by ELFA and by NIFA, um, I guess it was in 2019. And they both had said, hey, we're really interested in having, you know, you, somebody in marketing with your experience, serve on committee, board, X, Y, Z. And uh, I didn't really take an active role in ELFA at the time. So I felt like NIFA was a more, um, you know, it made more sense for me to participate. And so I had said, they said, you know, we're doing a call for entries for, for, you know, potential board members. Is it something that you'd be interested? And I said, well, only if I can drive value. Uh, I really want to drive value for the association and for the members. And, uh, and so, you know, they, they uh, luckily invited me to, to sit on the board and it's really important role to me personally. I show up to the meetings. Um, I show up and participate in the association, all the calls, all the work that goes into it. And I care because one, I'm trying to represent my own personal brand and also represent a more 
and we're really dedicated, both Amor and myself, to driving this industry forward and to really driving value for the members of NEFA. And, and I care about this entire industry so that we can evolve, right? And there are specific areas, and I would say marketing and technology are the two areas that I think the entire industry needs to really focus on and really needs to embrace, to challenge ourselves on and to evolve with, right? Um, yeah. And I'm not really sure we, we do a great job with that. And so, you know, Don sits on the board with me, Don Casenza from, from North Mill, and he's, he's one of the other marketers in the space and there aren't many of us. Um, so no. to be able to, to be on the board and to talk about the importance of marketing and marketing the value of the association to its members, you know, I think it's fantastic. It's a privilege and I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to enjoy the, the ride because I know it won't last forever. And to make sure that when I'm at an event, I try to meet as many people as I can and say, hey, I'm on the board. How do you feel about this conference? Is it your first conference? Welcome. What can we do? How can we help you drive growth for your business? Uh, and I wish more people were like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, NIFA was my first, or EAEL was my first conference I ever went to in 2005. Um, and, you know, I was 23. So right. very young. Yeah. And a, and not a young, not a young person's industry. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the association is kind of contagious because of just the friendships and like the friendliness of everything. But it, it can be intimidating. Um, but that's, you know, I, I appreciate that about yourself. And, you know, a lot of the people on the board, you know, they're welcome. Like, who do you want to meet? Let me right. take you around. Let's, right. you want to do business with who? Okay, well, I can make that introduction. The rest is on you. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that's great. That's what this industry, is. you know, that's what's so great about this industry, right? They talked about uh, making sure that if it's your first time at, at an event, you can have someone that can sort of mentor you take you around. I always introduce them to Stephanie or Reed or, you know, May, I call them sort of the mayors of, of NIFA. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you know, but it's, it's, it's important that we, we make everyone feel welcome. So yeah, I love it. I agree a hundred percent there. Um, so I asked everyone who comes on here, a little fun fact about themselves, anything you'd like to share? Yeah. So I think we were talking about this earlier, but those types of questions, like fun facts about yourself. I'm like, oh, not really that fun, but I did come up with one thing that I thought was interesting um, and I'll share it. And so hopefully I don't, I don't want this to be a political conversation, but um, it does have some political you know, backbones. So uh, when I worked in luxury retail, so that's something maybe not everyone knew about me, but I spent about a decade working in luxury retail in Manhattan um, and I, I loved it. Um, and so I got a call one day from, um, from Bill Clinton's office and uh, was told that um, Hillary would like to uh, make a visit with their daughter, Chelsea. And we worked at a bridal oh. registry destination on Fifth Avenue. And so um, I had to get on the phone with the secret service and they did a background check on me and they needed the schematics of the building. And it was very intense and overwhelming. Wow. And I was like, what is it that you wanna know about me exactly? You know. Um, but it was great. And so they called me and said, you know, um, Hillary Clinton's here. She's outside. You have to come up and meet her. And so I went out to this, you know, marble foyer and all these black cars pulled up and out comes Hillary Clinton with Secret Service. And um, I'm in this freight elevator. I was like five months pregnant at the time with my oldest son. And, <laughs> and there's Hillary sitting next to me. And uh, for those people that do know me, I don't really get intimidated often, maybe ever, um, but spending a night with Hillary Clinton and her daughter and participating in helping um, them with her bridal registry and getting to know Hillary, um, it was an amazing moment in my life. And it is also the only time that I can say I was actually intimidated. Um, just the confidence and the power that she exuded um, I was definitely intimidated, but it was lovely. It was a lovely event. That's, that's, uh, yeah, it's one to remember. That's for sure. Yes. Um, My favorite part about that, by the way, was at that night, Hillary's mother 
was at a bar drinking margaritas um, and couldn't come to be a part of the, the registry experience. And so Hillary was showing me pictures of her, her mother getting a little intoxicated at a bar drinking margaritas. So um, it was that kind of night, it was fun. Uh, yeah, well, you were five months pregnant, so was, your your options were limited at that at, the, at that point. But uh, how, did you did you be like, by the way, do I get to come? Right. No. No. It was. Well, it was funny. I was just so nervous. She was like, she's like, oh, you know, you're expecting, and and you know the sex. And I said yes. And she's like, can I ask what the name was? And I was like, that's a that's a critical moment when you're standing there with someone who is you know iconic to me as a yeah. woman. Um, and you're like, do I tell her the name of my unborn child? What if she doesn't like the name of my unborn child? <laughs> do I have to switch the name? You know, like you go through all these things in your mind. You're like, okay. And then I was like, uh, we're going to name him Leighton. And she was like, I love that name. I was like, okay. <laughs> Even if you lied to me. Okay. Right. Right. I'll tell you at the wedding. When is it? Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, I didn't even want to go. I was so terrified just spending a night with Emma Lowen. I was, I was good. It was enough. No, that's fair. That's fair. A little fun fact about me. My first job out of college was retail. Oh, was it? What did you do? Um, I was division one manager at JCPenney in Co-op City. Wow. So it was, it was in New York, but it was in the Bronx, not oh, love downtown. The Bronx. And it was not okay. luxury. However, um, division one is women's accessories. So bras, panties, handbags, and cosmetics. 21-year-old kid out of college. That was interesting. It was, that's a very interesting job. Very interesting yep. job for that. Yes. That's great. I'm sure you have stories about that, Jesse. And, and over a cocktail, I will tell you another story, but it's not <laughs> going to be recorded and not going to be on this channel. <laughs> right. Exactly. I understand that very well. Yeah. Um, so I guess in closing here, Jacqueline, you know, the different equipment finance organizations out there, you know, why do business with more? Yeah. So that's a great question. And I would say, you know, what I love about Amore, we talked about our culture and who we are and our people and that we're from you know, Nebraska and we're very proud of that. But what we love most about Amore is that every business, no matter the size, starts out small right? Just like us. We started out small in Grand Island, Nebraska, and now look at us, right? We're the largest yeah. in the US. Uh, but every business starts out small. And we just try to make sure that we show up for every small business owner, every partner, every customer, every employee when they need us most. And for us, we say we're big on small because we're big on small. We're big on small business. We're big on small moments, small wins. And they add up over time and they, they tell a great story. So for us, it's about making sure that you have great partners, great relationships, provide the best service. And that's who we are. Um, that's who we are as a culture, as a people. And uh, we have great partners, great employees, great customers. And for those that aren't working with us, you know, you should check us out. I think we're kind of a big deal. We're kind of a big deal. Yeah, I could, I could see that. And I think that the way that you've marketed that organization is, uh, has a big deal to do with that. So um, I, I so. really appreciate your time today, Jacqueline, and look forward to hopefully seeing you somewhere. I don't know if we'll be at a conference in the near future, but- um, Are you going to AACFB? Will you be in Charlotte? Um, I'm supposed to be at uh, Stonebriar has their event that same, okay. basically those same days, but I might try to swing over on uh, Wednesday. Okay. So. Well, I'll see you, I'm sure, along the way somewhere. All right. Sounds great. I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.